Welcome to the Cedar Fort Come Follow Me Made Easier podcast. I am your host, Linda Cherry. This week, we're studying Moses 7. We might call it part two with Sam Castor, who is the author of the book, Zion Rising, and also has a website by that name. As we contemplate the city of Enoch or the city of Zion and the great miracles that they achieved, it's important for us to also review and think about the promise that is contained in the Joseph Smith translation of Genesis 9 that records the promise that the Lord gave to Enoch with the first sign of the rainbow. And that promise was that when the people of the earth remembered Zion and looked upward and asked for the help of Zion, that Zion would look downward and that would begin the true unification of two Zions, one that had been built on earth and one that was in heaven. This is what that scripture records. And again, this is Joseph Smith translation of Genesis chapter 9, verses 21 and 23. When men shall keep all my commandments, Zion should again come on the earth, the city of Enoch, which I have caught up unto myself. And this is mine everlasting covenant, that when thy posterity shall embrace the truth and look upward, then shall Zion look downward, and all the heavens shall shake with gladness, and the earth shall tremble with joy, and the general assembly of the church of the firstborn shall come down out of heaven and possess the earth, and shall have a place until the end come. And this is mine everlasting covenant, which I have made with Enoch. Again, that's the Joseph Smith translation of Genesis chapter 9, 21 through 23. Now, Brigham Young spoke on this topic as he urged the saints to have a better understanding of the fact that Zion's not going to just come down miraculously. We must do our part on earth as well. Brigham Young said this, when we conclude to make a Zion, we will make it. And this work commences in the heart of each person. Zion can come only to a place that is completely ready for it, which is to say Zion must already be there. When Zion descends to earth, it must be met by a Zion that is already here. And they shall see us, and we will fall upon their necks, and they shall fall upon our necks, and there shall be mine abode, and it shall be Zion. Brigham said, I have Zion in my view constantly. We are not going to wait for angels or for Enoch and his company to come and build up Zion, but we are going to build it so that we will be ready. If we did not have a responsibility for bringing Zion, and if we did not work constantly with that aim in view, its coming could not profit us much. For all its awesome perfection and beauty, Zion is still our business and should be our constant concern. Well, you are going to be able to tell that Zion is a constant concern for Sam as he shares the how, the why, uh, even a bit of the where of our building Zion today. So Zion is much more than individuals living righteously, and it's more than keeping the commandments. Uh, Sam is going to help us to understand that just as Brigham taught, Zion is a state of heart that has to start, start with each one of us as individuals. For Enoch, it says that when he had the vision of what the Lord showed him, Uh, of the whole purpose of the earth and all of the uh, blessings and promises that would come to pass, as well as the challenges and trials. It says that Enoch's heart swelled wide as eternity, and his bowels yearned, and all eternity shook. Sam is going to emphasize the fact that each of us need to have that heart-stretching, our heart-swelling experience of making the Lord's goal and work our goal and work. It starts first with a love of God. And then that love of God fills our hearts with such pure Christ-like love or charity that we have no desire but to reach out and to bless our fellow men and sisters, I might add. And so um, as we think about and contemplate the principles of Zion, I pray that our hearts might be touched that we also 
will remember that we have a responsibility here on earth, each one of us. Zion can begin with each one of us first and then within our families, within our communities and stretch out from there. Uh, we want to thank you again for tuning in to the Cedar Fork Come Follow Me Made Easier podcast. We so appreciate you. And I know you're going to really enjoy this time with Sam. Thank you so much. Hello, welcome to Moses chapter 7 in the Come Follow Me lesson for this week. I'm Sam Castor, and this lesson is on Enoch and his city, part 2, what I like to refer to as Zion Rising. I am so excited to be here with you for this discussion today. Moses 7 contains so many amazing treasures, but the most beautiful treasure of all is the exchange between Moses and Jesus Christ. As you go through this lesson with me today, I hope you hear Christ's voice, not mine. The message that he had for Enoch and those of his time is the same message that he has for us now, that he loves us, that he knows us, and that he wants to help us return from the fall to heaven above. To recap from what happened last week, we talked about Moses chapter 6 and Genesis 5 and how Enoch used the plan of salvation to preach righteousness and repentance to those around him who were living in great wickedness and darkness at that time. We talked about how when Adam and Eve fell, they actually experienced not only a physical and spiritual fall that created death and pain in the absence from them and their, their prior premortal existence and their, their, their separation from our heavenly parents, but that when they ate the fruit, God the Father actually came to Adam and Eve and said, Where art thou? Which in Hebrew is ayaka, meaning not just where art thou physically, but where is your light? That fall, that loss of light, that loss of heavenly senses led to the need to rise. And we talked about how Enoch's own personal restorative awakening in Christ allowed Enoch to understand that he had been believing lies about himself that were preventing him from seeing his true relationship with Christ, his true identity. He was believing that he was but a lad, that he was hated of all men because he was slow of speech. Those lies were preventing Enoch from being his true self and from being able to understand how he could help those around him to become more like Christ and rise back home to heaven above. Once he surrendered those lies to Christ and felt Christ's love and received of Christ's truth, Enoch had the power of God's word. That power was able to allow Enoch to move mountains, to turn back rivers, and to make lions roar in defense of the righteous. Enoch's message was so important and so pivotal that it was preserved in a book of remembrance, but it was also preserved in ancient symbols that are elegant and simple and designed to transcend the language barriers and the time and the loss that we would have as we would progress through this earth, the loss of meaning and understanding. And so those symbols are elegant with the symbol of the circle representing heaven and also the number three being associated with that circle because of the number three being representative of the Godhead or the three kingdoms up in heaven above. The square would represent the earth or the four corners or four quarters of the earth and that would be associated with the number four. When you add heaven plus earth, you get seven or Zion. We talked about how the church's logo currently has a celestial dome or circle above Christ and his hands reaching down as he also lifts up the earth beneath, which is a square, to join that circle above and create Zion between his loving and and fighting hands. Those symbols are so powerful and so influential that they have been utilized throughout the history of religions and throughout the history of temples, churches, religious art, and scriptures. They even exist in ancient artifacts as old as the Leningrad Codex, which is a symbol of a circle and then a square and then multiple circles and squares within that and what looks like to be the Star of David. That symbol also appears everywhere in our modern buildings, in our churches and temples and artwork and scriptures. It's in the Las Vegas temple. It's in the Bountiful temple. It's in the Palmyra temple. It's in the Kentucky temple. The circle and the square, the uniting of heaven and earth even exists in other religions beyond just the Salt Lake Temple or the temples that you may be near. It also exists, and I found this to be fascinating but true, in Orthodox cathedrals, including the one that I visited in Moldova, that has a square at its base and multiple squares rising up to a pinnacle 
with a celestial dome above pointing us heavenward and reminding us that we are meant to unite heaven and earth together here below as Zion. So as we jump in now to Moses chapter 7, I thought it would be more valuable for us to explore his story at a high level and outline it and then unpack the principles and doctrines that Enoch shares with us about his own interactions with Christ. Again, I hope the story is powerful and helpful, but I also hope that you hear Christ's voice sharing his love with you just as he shared it with Enoch, because it is love that changes our hearts and prepares us for heaven above. The rough story outline of Enoch's exchange here in Moses chapter 7 includes Enoch having a face-to-face -face interaction with Christ, actually speaking with him face-to-face -face in Moses chapter 7 verse 4. Then Mo, uh, Enoch is given a prophetic vision, the prophetic vision, where he sees the particles of the universe, all of God's creations. He sees the past, present, and future, and understands what's going to befall men as they proceed on, the, as we all proceed on this earth life here below. That's in Moses seven five through ten. What's interesting is that there are pseudo epigraphal books that talk about this exchange as well. One of which is the Lost Book of Adam and Eve, which talks about how Enoch was actually carried up to heaven by none other than Adam or Michael as an archangel and also by another angel by the name of Gabriel. I just want to highlight the beautiful symbolism here. We don't know if this is exactly what happened, but we do know that these books were present at the time of Christ and referred to by Christ. And many scholars believe that they once were actually contained in the Bible itself. And the exchange here is beautiful and symbol symbolic and symmetrical as well, because as Enoch is lifted up into heaven, Michael, the archangel, his great, 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 great grandfather to the seventh power, and Noah, or Gabriel, his grandson, represent the different realms or the different circular presences of Enoch at the time he's a seer. Adam represents past, Enoch represents present, and Gabriel represents the future. As he's brought up into the presence of the Lord, Enoch falls at the feet of Christ, feeling unworthy, and the Lord instructs the two archangels to give at, to give Enoch a glorious robe of light. And he also gives him a scribe or a, a pen to record the books that he would write. And then Enoch is sent back down to earth below to preach righteousness to others. It's so transformative for Enoch, this experience in the presence of God, that his face begins to radiate light or holy Shekinah, which means the celestial burnings or celestial fire in Hebrew. And Enoch has this experience where he's about to be sent back down to earth to instruct his fellow brothers and sisters about what he's learned. And the scripture records that he had to freeze his face, meaning he had to cool it down because it was so filled with celestial fire and burning. Well, after this exchange, which is corresponding in the Moses 7 verses 5 through 10 exchange between Enoch and Christ, the Zion building experience starts to become interesting. Whenever Zion starts to build and there starts to become more light on the earth, there are those on the earth who are stuck in their ways or want to continue to choose their own paths and remain in darkness that become frustrated with the light and glory of Zion. Whenever Zion starts to rise to a higher level, there are those who will oppose it. But that opposition only gives Zion more lift to continue to rise. That happened here with Enoch as well. There's an ex interesting exchange where there are many at the time of, of this, this interaction between Zion and what we'll refer to as Babylon, or the Zion harmony that's being starting to, to happen with Enoch and his people as they begin to learn of Christ, and the Babylonian chaos that is devolving on earth below. What happens is those in Babylon start to rage against the light. It's almost as if like when you're in a room and it's dark and you're used to the dark and someone comes in and unexpectedly turns on the light and you wince or squint at it, that's what these people were like. I like to refer to them as squinters. And we have squinters in life today. Those who look at the brightness or the light or the, or the happiness of those who are living the gospel and they say, turn out the light. Where, where are my sunglasses? I don't want to see that brightness and that happiness. It's fake, it's not real. That's gotta be something that's not, uh, not happy. Those squinters, those who start to rage against the light, are described in Moses chapter 7, 11 through 12, and 18 through 20. And they become so frustrated with Zion and how it's flourishing in the mountains and it's having these amazing experiences and light and lift and radiance is emanating from them because Christ is in their presence, that those squinters or those Babylonian 
chaos artists decide to wage war against Zion. Now I want you to imagine this for just a second. There are people that are so frustrated with the righteousness of Zion that they decide the only way they can bring peace to themselves is to destroy it. Do you see how demonic and satanic that is? Well, that's what happened here. And Enoch, using the power of God's word, is able to defend Zion and its people by commanding mountains to move, by turning back rivers and causing lions to roar. There are giants at this time as well, and we don't know everything about how that works, but we do have some indications that giants were people that had been corrupted in the flesh, that had received some of God's glory, but chose to deny a lot of it and chose to follow their own paths. They were large. Some believe that these giants were the predecessors to the the giant that David ends up fighting with David and Goliath. We don't know for sure, but we do know that they were terrifying. Well, these giants and the wicked end up fighting against Zion, but Enoch is able to calm the war with the righteousness of God's word and command mountains and rivers and lions. After this happens, they are, the, the, the wicked are so afraid of Enoch and Zion that the, it, the scriptures describe them standing afar off. And Enoch actually commands the river bottom or the, the ocean bottom of the water next to where Zion is to rise up. And it's a desolate, weary wasteland almost without any f- fruit or vegetation. He rises it up from the ocean floor and the giants and the wicked flee to that new location and leave Zion alone in peace. Then Zion rises, literally, in the process of time. And we'll get into that, what the process of time means, and why I say it was not only symbolic, but literal. That's discussed in Moses 7, 21 through 24. Enoch then has this celestial, above the earth, almost satellite-like position, where he's able to see the continuation of the wicked below. And just as Zion starts to rise up to the heavens above, the chaotic Babylon below continues to devolve into even greater wickedness, war, and bloodshed. And Enoch sees Satan with great chains of darkness, blinding eyes, and hardening hearts in Moses 7, 25. Enoch starts to mourn for the earth. He hears the earth weeping. He also hears Christ weeping, and he sees the wickedness of people, and his heart starts to break. And he has this exchange with the Lord where he actually asks him why Christ is weeping and why he, the creator of the galaxies and the universes, the most glorious being in, in all, of, all of creations, why his heart would break for this, this people, this planet. And <clears throat> Enoch ends up having this exchange in Moses 7, 31 through 33, and it describes Enoch's exchange with the Lord very tenderly. And the Lord basically tells Enoch that this is the most wicked of all of the creations of God. This is the most dark, deep, destroyed area of, his, of all of his creations because of the wickedness of, of God's children on this planet at this time. And Enoch's heart, quote, swells wide as eternity for the wicked. He weeps for them. He mourns for the earth. That expansion of his heart that tenderness that Enoch explains that he feels as he starts to become aware of those around him and how broken they are, how they are enslaved because of the chains of darkness that Satan is wielding, leads Enoch to become even more like Christ. And Enoch wants to help save these people, these precious souls, even though they're wicked, even though they're destroying each other and raging in war and darkness and murder and bloodshed. And Enoch has an exchange with Christ and asks him, how will you bring peace to this destructive place? And Christ says, well, I'm going to wipe it with flood. I'm going to destroy this creation. And Enoch pleads with the Lord, like many wonderful prophets do. Moses did, Abraham did. And he pleads with the Lord and says, please spare this people. Please spare my grandson, Noah, who's going to be born. And please prepare a way for Christ to come in the meridian of time to save the planet, to save the people, and to help heaven regain the souls that it's lost down here below. Christ makes a covenant with Enoch. I like to refer to it as the rainbow covenant for the remnant. Now, the reason I describe it that way is a couple of reasons. Number one, there's a distinction between the remnant and the residue in these chapters and in many other locations in the scriptures. The remnant are the righteous, the salt of the earth, those that 
God knows, will continue down here on earth below and be a force for good, be a force for awakening and righteousness and help awaken and bring others into peace. We also know that the residue are the wicked. They're the ones that are left behind after Zion rises up into heaven above. And so there's the remnant and the residue down here below. And Enoch covenants with the Lord that he will allow some of his posterity, Noah, to stay on earth below, even though Enoch has risen up into the heavens, as long as the Lord promises to save them and comes personally down to the earth in the meridian of time to bring about his covenants and his promises. This exchange results in a symbol, and that covenant symbol is the rainbow. A lot of us think that the rainbow was first placed in the heavens because <clears throat> Noah sought a covenant from the Lord that he would never flood the earth again. But Joseph Smith translated Genesis 9.21 in, in the tr translated version of that chapter and that verse. He retranslated it to clarify that the symbol of the rainbow, that covenant symbol for the remnant, was first given to Enoch because Enoch's heart broke for his children and for the posterity, for us down here on the earth below. That beautiful symbol of the rainbow, by the way, if you go up above a rainbow and you take a picture of it, it actually looks like a circle, which is consistent with the symbols that we've been talking about, the circle of heaven or the rainbow from above being a circle, almost as if it's a portal to call us up to heaven above. And down here below, we see rainbows as if they're bridges calling us up to heaven above. The rainbow is the most beautiful symbol. And by the way, how many colors are in the rainbow? That's right. There are seven, Roy G. Biv, even though some current versions of the rainbow only have six colors. The true Zion symbol of the rainbow has seven. I want you to ponder on the significance of that distinction between God's rainbow and the world's rainbow at this time in the history of the world. We also know that Enoch ends up having this promise from the Lord that he will effectuate a reunion, a glorious finale to this earth, where Zion, quote, will come forth out of his creations, end quote, and, quote, the righteous will rise, end quote. That's in Moses 7, 62 through 64. This rising, this reunion, this reconnection of heaven and earth will be so glorious that we'll fall on each other's necks and weep for joy, and we will be finally reunited with those that we love. It'll be the most amazing, spectacular experience in all of the history of the earth. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more as we go through this. So let's talk about what Zion is. Now, we've, most of us have heard the phrase that Zion is the pure in heart. But the word Zion itself is interesting and gives us a lot of information about what Christ intends with this word, with this idea, and with this philosophy that we can adopt, this life practice we can adopt in our own hearts. The word Zion is not Hebrew. It, it is not Sanskrit. It predates those languages, and it predates the Hebrew spelling of Sion or Slion, and has no known etymological root or foundation. We don't know really where it came from, which leaves many scholars to believe that Zion is Adamic. It came from Adam or Enoch from Christ himself. Some suggest that Zion means a castle or a dry land consistent with Zion's, uh, Enoch's raising the dry land from the, the floor of the ocean, or for a Jeshubite fortress that King David conquered near Jerusalem that was called Zion. But the word and meaning of Zion is so much more than these concepts. Zion's true meaning is its purpose. Zion is our collective how to get back to heaven above. Zion is also made with our hearts. In Moses 7, verse 18, the Lord teaches us Zion is the pure in heart, like we've talked about, and those who are in Zion are of one mind and one heart, and they flourish in the mountaintops. Incidentally, it's interesting. Did you know that Isaiah prophesies that when Christ comes again in that last glorious reunion, that all the mountains will be laid low and all the valleys will be raised up and the earth will be perfectly spherical and round, like the symbol of the circle, finally celestialized? Mountains are designed to point us upward, and we climb Mount Zion in an effort to come closer to the heavens above. And they, they will serve their purpose, I believe, when the earth is finally glorified in its celestial state. What's interesting, though, is even though Zion is in the mountains, Zion is not only a place. Zion is a creative coexistence where we love each other and God and ourselves so perfectly 
it becomes, quote, physically impossible, end quote, for us to stay in a terrestrial state. Joseph Smith is the one that said it becomes physically impossible. And we'll get into that. There are no poor and there is no insurance in Zion. Let me unpack that for you. I used to be an insurance defense attorney. I know what it's like to deal with people who are engaged in fraud, who are trying to get something for nothing, who are doing whatever they can to take advantage of their neighbor. Well, in the higher degrees of glory that we're invited to through Christ, they don't take advantage of each other. They love each other. So there's no need for insurance. And there are no poor. That doesn't mean there are no wealthy. In fact, Zion is built by those with their wealth and their health in the service of their fellow beings, in the service of their God. This life here below, in this lower kingdom, the celestial kingdom, is about us learning to practice the art of love. It's about us learning to practice the art of uniting our hearts, the creative seats of our souls, so that we can unite heaven and earth as Zion and rise back home to heaven above. This happened with Enoch. And Moses 7 contains a beautiful illustration of this. When in Moses 7 verse 41, it talks about how Christ and his interaction with Moses, or excuse me, with Enoch, led to Enoch's heart stretching wide as eternity. Christ is inviting us to do the same thing. Oftentimes in this life, we find fleeting ideas, things, relationships, or possessions that we believe will bring us peace, safety, comfort, and we cling to them. We seek after them, these treasures that we put in our hearts that we think will bring us what we're looking for here down below. But as we focus on those things, and believe me, I've had my fair share of distractions, things that I think are exciting, cool technologies, cool entertainment, whatever it is, relationships that I believe are very important. As we cling to those, we fill our hands and our hearts with the dust of Babylon. All of that will decay. None of that will rise with us in the next life. Instead, Christ is inviting us to open our hearts and our hands and surrender that dust that we think will bring us comfort for the gold of everlasting life and eternity with him, for the water that will never leave us thirsty again. Like with Enoch, he is working in us to expand our hearts wide as eternity so that we can receive all he and our heavenly parents have. He's inviting us to love others as ourselves and our God to receive heaven above. Joseph Smith taught that when we do this, when we love each other, when we seek each other's happiness and joy, and we love God as ourselves, we have an amazing transformative experience. He taught that the community of Enoch, its people, and quote, the city and the foundations of the earth on which it stood, had partaken of so much of the immortal elements bestowed upon them by God through the teachings of Enoch, that it became philosophically impossible for them to remain any longer on the earth. He also taught that when it became impossible for it to remain on the earth, that glorious city where Christ dwelt and walked with the people and taught them how to be more like him, that the city of Enoch rose to the heavens, quote, with a large piece of the earth immediately connected with the foundations and the city, and it rose to an aerial position within the limits of our solar system, end quote. There it remained, partially behind the veil, as a fixed reminder of Earth's destiny to rise from its fallen state. That's from Enoch and His City, a book, a little pamphlet that was written by the brother of Brigham Young, Joseph Young, who recorded those teachings by Joseph Smith in 1878. I have a copy of it, and it's one of my most prized possessions. It teaches the beautiful, simple truth that the most effective symbols, the most powerful illustrations in the scriptures are not just symbolic, but literal designed to affect not only our physical senses, but our spiritual senses. Joseph Smith also taught, and this was recorded by George Lobb in 1844. He said that the prophet taught, quote, now I will tell the story of the designs 
of building the Tower of Babel. It was designed to go to the city of Enoch, for the veil was not yet so great that it hid it from their sight. So they concluded to go to the city of Enoch, for God gave him a place above the impure air, for above he could breathe a pure air. And Enoch and his city were taken up, for God provided a better place for them, for they were pure in heart." End quote. Isn't that amazing? Enoch was lifted up not only to escape Babylon, but to get to a purer air, to get closer to heaven, because their pure hearts needed to be closer to Christ. Orson F. Whitney echoes this teaching. For those of you who are doubting whether this is actual doctrine or this is something that is actually physically, potentially possible for us. He taught, quote, It has been taught that it was the object of the people who built the Tower of Babel to reach heaven, to attain to one of the starry planets, one of the heavenly bodies. This sounds indeed like a fairy tale, that they could actually reach the sun, moon, or one of the stars simply by piling brick upon brick, stone upon stone. But the prophet Joseph Smith, whose mission it was to shed light upon the darkness of this generation, is said to have declared that it was not their intention to, te to reach heaven, but to reach Zion, which was then suspended in midair between heaven and earth or at such a height as to render the project feasible. This certainly is more reasonable." End quote. Joseph Smith also taught and noted that, quote, the city of Enoch would again take its place in the identical spot from which it had been detached, now forming that chasm of the earth filled with water called the Gulf of Mexico, end quote. The city itself was wrapped in God's glory and lifted up into heaven and left a, a, a hole, a chasm. Now, I've researched this. I don't know if this is where the city of Enoch was, but there is a crater in the Gulf of Mexico about 110 miles wide. Again, I don't know if this is it, but it gives us a sense of the size, potentially, of Enoch City and its glorious ascent into heaven. It also is potentially possible there because it's right off the Yucatan Peninsula and it's partially on land and partially on water, consistent with the story or the, the narrative in Moses 7 where Enoch raises some of the, the ocean floor for the wicked to flee to. That crater is oftentimes pointed to as the, the impact site of a meteor or asteroid that destroyed and made the dinosaurs go extinct. Now here's what's interesting. Now I used to, I used to want to be a paleontologist when I was in kindergarten. So I studied this and I got into it and wanted to understand more of it. The Chicxulub crater off the Gulf of Mexico has been criticized as not a potential impact site for that meteor because there is no meteor there. There's no iridium, no trace amounts of any other type of space material that are usually found in that type of a crater if it really was created by an impact from space above. Additionally, there's no evidence of mining or other man-made activity to cause this big circular ring. And the National Academy of Sciences has created some pretty cool illustrations of this that you can see on my slide that talk about or that, that, sh that showcase what this probably looked like. It almost looks like there was a piece of the earth scooped up and lifted up into heaven. And there are other pieces of earth and craters left behind that I talk about in my book, Zion Rising, because this didn't just happen once, it happened multiple times. Why is it that that piece of earth would rise? What is it that makes that fundamental and essential to God's plan and also symbolic of how he lifts us from the fall? Well, I believe there's one word to describe or to explain why we have this rising. We start in heaven above, which I have here in my graph represented by a circle, and we fall down to earth below. We have our experiences on earth, which I have represented by a square, consistent with the symbolism that Enoch's given to us. And as we progress forward, we have death, and we descend even lower away from our parents, even farther away from their celestial sphere. We then end up in the spirit world, and because of Christ and his gift and his transformative atonement, he lifts us back up and reintroduces us to be judged into heaven. Now, when he judges us, he distinguishes and we distinguish ourselves with our hearts where we want to end up. We can either end up in the celestial kingdom, which has the glory of the stars, 
or we can end up in the terrestrial kingdom, which has the glory of the moon, or we can end up in the celestial kingdom, which has the glory of the sun. That's talked about in Corinthians as well, the, and DNC 76. The distinguishing variable, the thing that makes the difference about what kingdom you end up in is love, as you can see is spelled out here with this diagram. I didn't come up with this. I borrowed it from someone else. I don't know who the original author is, but I do know that this symbol of love being the motivation behind the plan of salvation is true. It's because Christ is all about love, then truth. All of us down here below, when we fall, we're all drowning. We're all struggling. We all have failings and frailties and pain and sorrow and weakness. We bump into each other and bruise each other and we weep and mourn and we know that this earth life is difficult. We're all drowning. And when someone's drowning, you can't walk up to them and yell at them to stop drowning. It's not going to fix the problem. Just like when someone is having difficulty in their life, you can't tell them just to shape up and get over it. That's not what Christ does with us either. He doesn't come to us and scold us and tell us to be more like him and, and bark at us. Instead, he starts with love. I used to be a lifeguard, and the, the analogy of drowning is very effective for my brain and my heart because if you see someone drowning you know that they're struggling they may not even know which way is up and when someone is in that position as a lifeguard you learn that you need to you can help them but in order to help them you have to be in a good place yourself first and you can throw them a life preserver which could be symbolic of love but you need to have that life preserver or that ring off the one of those you know safety rings off of a boat it needs to be attached to something. That rope or that anchor is truth. Love helps us get above the water. It helps us remember who we are. It helps us reconnect with Christ. And then his truth brings us back to the safety of the shore. His truth helps us learn how to even one day walk on water. Despite storms, despite difficulties, that's one of the things he's trying to help us learn how to do. And when we go through our life experiences and we interact with others, if we start first with love, we can soften each other's hearts and open them up so that they can then receive the truth and be pulled back to reality. Love without truth is almost meaningless. There's a current movement in the world today to define love as meaning something that it's not. Love without truth is worthless. And truth without love is damaging. We need both for us to be able to understand how we can connect with our Savior and become more like him. Because we are all drowning, Christ's love, then his truth, is what can lift us back home to heaven above. His love, or the pure love of Christ, is described as charity. Christ and his charity are the why. That's why he does what he does. But as we've talked about earlier, Zion is the how. Zion is the vehicle for us to learn to live terrestrial, then telestial, then celestial law. Building Zion will bring about the destruction of the, oh, excuse me, this is a quote from Joseph Smith. He said, building Zion will bring about the destruction of the powers of darkness, the renovation of the earth, the glory of God, and the salvation of the human family, end quote. Christ uses Zion to, quote, unite the heavenly priesthood with the earthly, end quote, and bring about his great purposes and establish eternal peace. Zion is how we do everything that brings us closer to heaven with Christ at, a, at our helm. Now, again, for those who are questioning whether this literal lifting, this vehicle that we have in Zion to regain our light, to have light and lift, elevation and illumination that we can rise and radiate with Christ for those questioning whether or not that was just symbolic or it was actually physical I want to point you to DNC 2934 where Christ himself said all things unto me are spiritual and not at any time have I given unto you a law which was temporal his laws of love that help us rise and radiate that help us come closer to him are not just symbolic, they're literal. And we know that when we obey our heavenly parents' divine laws, it gives us this ability to become Zion and rise back up and regain our divine senses. We can view Christ's commandments, 
and his invitations to love each other as ourselves and to love him as lessons in a sort of celestial physics. It's almost as if his commandments are designed to literally and symbolically empower us and lift us home to our heavenly parents with Christ as our divine instructor. Let's talk about why. Again, the kingdoms that we may end up in or that we are invited to as we leave this life after death, all of those kingdoms have laws given unto them and each of those kingdoms has a law of love associated with them. In the celestial kingdom, associated with the glory of the stars that vary in degrees, everyone is a law unto themselves. This is in Doctrine and Covenants 88 and DNC uh, 121, and it talks about how those in that kingdom, they are able to abide the presence of the Holy Ghost, but they seek after their own. They love themselves. And it's interesting because there really are four types of love that we are able to experience as God's children. We can love things, which is okay. It's okay. It's not a bad thing to love a nice new vehicle or a new haircut or some type of dessert. Apple pie is my favorite. But loving things does not bring us any closer to God. In fact, if that's all we love, then we become stuck. The next love is love of ourselves. And that also is a degree of glory. But if that's all we do, love ourselves and love things, no one's going to be our friend. No one's going to want to connect with us or be around us because we're focused on ourselves. We become selfish. Then there's the love of others. And then there's the love of God. Those four loves are how we stack the kingdoms. That's what differentiates us and where we end up. And we get to choose what we love. We get to choose where our hearts are and what we treasure with them. So in the celestial kingdom, the love of self, which is this world, we have plenty of examples of this. There are people who love their cars more than their children. There are people who love their new computer more than spending time with their family or you name it, their job, whatever object it is or whatever it is that brings them peace and happiness. They love those things more than they love the others around them. That love of self is a law unto itself and it can't rise any higher. But as we learn to love others as ourselves, we can rise to the celestial kingdom, which is what Enoch and his city did. That's why there were no poor among them. And that's why They were of one mind and one heart because they loved each other. They were united in purpose of getting back home to heaven above. That terrestrial glory allowed them to be in the presence, the reigning presence of Christ. He's the God of the terrestrial kingdom. And he invites us and teaches us how to rise to the celestial kingdom where the law of love is not just love of self and love of others. The law of love also includes the love of God. Now, you may be asking yourself, what's the difference between the love of God and the love of others? And I think that there are plenty of examples, if you sit and ponder this, we, that you may have in your life where people choose to love someone else more than they love God. It may be a child, which I can have compassion on and understand. I love my children. It may be a relationship, a spouse. It may be someone that brings them peace or happiness or a boss. Loving someone else more than loving God prevents us from rising back home to our heavenly parents and being in their reigning glory and presence. When we're with them, when we love them, we naturally love others and ourselves. And we're able to enjoy things too and have that fourth degree of love. When we're in our heavenly parents' presence, we enjoy godliness, which is loving others and helping them become like our heavenly parents. We enjoy charity, light, felicity, truth, glory, individuality, and unity. But when we're stuck down in the celestial kingdom, we are only able to enjoy selfishness, darkness, disharmony, war, and enmity. I don't know about you, but I want to get to the top. I want to be back with my heavenly parents, with my family. And God is teaching us how to do that here below. That's because God is a God of oneness. He reconciles dichotomies. He brings together disharmonies into harmony. And he's able to do that down here below because he allows opposition in all things. That opposition, that tension here below where we're able to choose which way we want to go, 
allows God to reconcile those things that war or oppose each other naturally by bring, in a lower state by bringing them to become harmonic and united in a higher state. He does this with all sorts of things. Think about your heart and your mind. They can be in conflict, but Christ is teaching us how to listen to our hearts and our minds and bring us into harmony internally. He does it with sickness and health. Sickness is a part of the life cycle down here below, and he's teaching us how to use that cycle to bring him closer to him, bring us closer to him. He reconciles women and men. We don't always get along, but when we do, it's powerful and beautiful and godly. He reconciles peace and war, light and darkness, life and death, and heaven and earth. In fact, this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. This is what Enoch was learning in Moses 7. He was learning that he could call others to Christ, even those that were wicked. And Enoch tells us in Moses 7 that many were caught up to heaven even after he left. This is our divine heritage as the followers of Christ, to turn sickness to health, sin to sanctification, war into peace, darkness into light, and burning brilliant gold from the dark lead that surrounds us here below, until all the sickness, sin, war, and darkness are rid from the earth, and our streets in heaven above are paved with gold. This is the opportunity that we are learning down here below. We do this through the transformative and restorative power of charity, which is Christ's atoning and elevating pure love. He loves all of his children, even the ones that are drowning, especially them. And all those who accept his love can become like him. He is the great elevator of all. This process, <laughs> this process, uh, our path to perfect perfection takes time. In fact, Enoch talks about how Zion rose in the, quote, process of time, end quote. Now, time is a, a unique gift in this celestial state. We know that time will not exist in the future. Once Christ comes again, there will be no more time, according to several scriptures in the Doctrine and Covenants and the Bible. But time here is an element designed to be our benefit, and God is the master of time. He can accelerate or slow down our experience here to help work his miracle in us, his mighty work and his wonder. So let's talk about how long it took for Enoch. Now this process, we know, took about 365 years. It's a long time. But time, again, is not our natural element. In fact, Maxwell talked about how the reason we wear wristwatches, Elder Maxwell, he said it's because it's not our natural element. We're, in many respects, like a fish out of water in time. That's why we're constantly trying to check the time, because it's not part of our eternal programming. It's not consistent with our awareness of, of truth as a past, present, and future. So it took Enoch 365 years. Now we could debate about whether that's literal or symbolic again, but there is a powerful symbol in this number because Enoch's time on earth itself and his time in the heavens in a terrestrial state, awaiting his translation to a celestial state, is a symbol of Zion. Let me tell you how. Enoch lived 65 years. Zion in the heavens lasted 365 years until at the end of the chapter it says Zion fled. If you add 65 plus 365, guess what number you get? 430 years. Four for earth, three for heaven. Combining those two together gives you the golden number of seven or Zion. I know, I'm a numbers geek. I love it though. That symbol is everywhere. In fact, it's a symbol that exists in nature. And when you start to understand the symbolism and that God is calling to us through so many things around us, you start to wake up to the reality that this is the whole function of this earth life is to build Zion here and now. Zion is the destiny of this planet. For Zion, or, or for seven or Zion is everywhere. God gave Enoch the seventh son, a seven colored rainbow, like we talked about, as a covenant of Enoch's sacrifice to leave a remnant on earth below, starting with his grandson Noah. This occurred in Moses chapter seven. I know, it's crazy, isn't it? That symbol is everywhere. It also exists with how many seas we have, seven. How many continents there are, seven. How many days in the week are there, 
7. In fact, when Heavenly Father appeared to Joseph Smith, he spoke seven words when he announced his son. This is my beloved son. Hear him. And President Nelson highlighted this several conferences ago. This beautiful symbol of seven, of heaven and earth united perfectly as Zion, is what we're meant to do. It's also influenced all major religions throughout the history of the world. Well, let me just give you some examples. If you want more or the citations for these, you can look in my book, Zion Rising, which goes into greater detail about these, but these are just some of the highlights. First of all, Christianity and Judaism. In Genesis 5, 24, we know, quote, Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him, end quote. And those following Enoch's order are of the order of the, quote, high priesthood, end quote, or high priests. In Islam, in the Quran, chapter 19, verse 56, it says Enoch was, quote, a man of truth, a prophet, raised to a high position, end quote. The Egyptians taught that pharaohs were the sons of Ra, a celestial god riding a solar arc to raise the sun, just like Enoch was floating in Zion above and was visible from the earth below. It clearly had an impact on the Egyptians, on Islam, on Christianity and Judaism. But it doesn't stop there. Japan and China, their emperors, hundreds of them, were called the sons of heaven, who ruled with authority from above after having been given a divine mandate from heaven. European monarchies, from England, excuse me, England, Spain, Portugal, Austria, France, were referred to as royalty or highness, indicative of them being above or elevated higher than their subjects with a divine right from heaven above. Buddhism, yes, we'll go over Buddhism too, teaches of a stepped continuum of heavens rising higher and higher to receive crowns of glory. And many Native American tribes believe our purpose on earth here below is to reunite Mother Earth with Father Sky. This idea of uniting heaven and earth has influenced cultures and religions throughout time. Zion is the act of uniting heaven and earth, and it's the act that all the ancients sought. They all sought Zion, the ancient patriarchs and matriarchs. Since Enoch's glorious ascent, gathering, restoring, and raising Zion became the governing theme of prophets, prophetesses, priests, priestesses, kings, and queens. For all holy men and women sought the community reserved by Christ and received unto himself. Hebrews 11 goes on at length about this. Zion remained a universal invitation back home to heaven, a pattern we are invited to follow to unite our hearts until we are, quote, wrapped in the power and glory of our maker, caught up to dwell with him, end quote. That's from Joseph Smith. In fact, did you know that Hebrews was sung communally as a way for the ancient Hebrews to purify and connect their hearts so they could enter the judgment seat or the holy seat, the mercy seat of Christ. This idea of us harmonizing our hearts together in song and in worship and in service to each other has been transformative for so many. Our righteous ancestors looked forward with joyful anticipation to that day in which we live and quote, fired with heavenly and joyful anticipations they have sung and written and prophesied of this our day, end quote. That's again from Joseph Smith. The Lord invited all his ancient patriarchs and matriarchs to create the peace of Zion below, first in their hearts, then in their families, then their communities until they were fit to join Zion above. Christ continues to harvest souls on earth even today by carrying them up into Zion his, quote, secret place of the Most High, end quote. And that's from Doctrine and Covenants 45, 10 through 14. This call of Zion has been preserved in the Old Testament and in the New Testament by references to the Most High. In fact, in Psalm 83, 18, quote, the Most High, 
Christ is referred to as the most high over all the earth. And in Psalms 93.1, he's referred to as the most high so consistently that there's actually 43 references in addition to Psalms 93.1 in the Old Testament. Yep, four and three, symbolic itself of seven. In the New Testament, that number dwindles to seven, the number of references to the most high God. But this idea of Zion being above, of Christ being the most high, of God's thoughts being above our thoughts, his ways above our ways, is not just symbolic, it's also literal. And there have been multiple examples of it. Joseph Fielding Smith taught, quote, The Lord who created the earth certainly controls it. Why try to deny him this power? Moreover, we are taught that portions of this earth have been taken from it, such as the city of Enoch, which included the land surface as well as the people, end quote. I want to point you to those, uh, uh, another scripture that reinforces what Joseph Fielding Smith taught, because he's talking about not only Enoch city, but Melchizedek city, and also other communities that have risen up to the Lord. In Jacob 4, verse 9, he teaches, quote, If God being able to speak, and the world was, and to speak, and man was created, O oh, then, why not able to command the earth, or the workmanship of his hands upon the face of it, according to his will and pleasure, end quote. Of course he's going to use the earth to do amazing miracles, to waken his children, and bring about his glorious work and his wonders upon their hearts and help them rise back up to Zion above. Zion rising occurs communally. This idea of communal translation is something that has been preserved in many religions as well. In fact, Melchizedek didn't just rise to heaven above by himself. He rose with Salem or another city of Zion. The Jaredites talked about translation as a community. In fact, right after the Tower of Babel, when the brother of Jared and Jared are conversing about what they're going to do and where they're going to go now that their language has been preserved, but everyone else's languages has been, have been corrupted, the brother of Jared goes and asks the Lord to see if he will carry them to a land that is choice above all others. They were seeking a communal higher state. Moses, we know according to Alma, was also translated, and I believe it wasn't just by himself, but he was translated with those that he loved. The Rechabites in Jeremiah 35 also were translated, and there is a book of the Rechabites that talks about the state they lived in at a a higher level of love, in a glorious garden closer to God. Alma 13 talks at length about many scriptures that talk about Melchizedek, and also talks about how many were carried up into the rest of the Lord. And DNC 8499 talks about how this pattern of translation, this communal rising, is something that we all have to, uh, to look forward to. You can learn a lot more about these again at zionrising.org, but I want to highlight just a couple of points. First of all, how is this going to happen? How are we going to end up in a place where we actually are fit for the kingdom of heaven above? such that our cities and our communities rise up together in love? Well, John Taylor taught, quote, Zion's people will excel in literature, in science, and the arts, and in manufactures as never before, until when the Lord's purposes are carried out, we shall have the most magnificent buildings, the most pleasant and beautiful gardens, the most healthy and the most intellectual people, cities fit to be caught up, that when Zion ascends from above, Zion well, excuse me, when Zion descends from above, Zion will also ascend from beneath. And he's quoting DNC 8499 there. It's no wonder that Joseph Smith taught that, quote, we ought to have the building up of Zion as our greatest object. The time is soon coming when no man will have any peace but in Zion and her stakes, end quote. This is because Zion is the harmony of hearts. When our hearts are not living to their full potential, when our spirits know that our bodies are doing things that we're not supposed to, there's a dissonance, a disharmony in ourselves, as if there's war in our hearts. And that fear and pain that we feel that causes that disharmony creates war all around us. We do this as humans to justify our position, our insanity, our disconnect from the world around us. We want to try and prove to the world that we're not crazy, but everyone else is. 
and we were, when we refuse to reconcile our pain and our fear in the atonement of Jesus Christ, we choose to prove that we are an exception to the rule, that we don't have to be one with others and with him. That's why there is no peace but in Zion and her stakes. Brigham Young echoed this. He taught, quote, We have no business here other than to build up and establish the Zion of God after that pattern and order by which Enoch built up and perfected the former day Zion, which was taken away to heaven, end quote. As we unite our gifts and our talents, whether they are in art or music or literature in architecture or manufacturing or gardens, whatever they may be, as we take those spiritual gifts we received up in heaven above and manifest them physically here below and unite our hearts together in a beautiful orchestration, a harmony of the, this beautiful tapestry of Zion, the Lord tells us that he will bring us into one until he brings down Zion from above and raises Zion from beneath. That's in DNC 84, 99 through 100. He is quote, gathering his elect from the four quarters of the earth, end quote, to his city and tabernacle, where, quote, we will receive them. They shall see us, and we will fall upon their necks, and they shall fall upon our necks, and we will kiss each other, end quote. That's in Moses 7, 62 through 64. That promise, joyful reunion, is going to be the most amazing, spectacular phenomenal experience of the earth. We're going to be back home together with Christ. It's going to be awesome. That revelation in Moses 7 has inspired so many works of art, but my favorite is the hymn, Let Zion in Her Beauty Rise. That hymn sings of that, quote, glorious day when the earth shall rest, end quote. Just like Enoch was worried about the earth groaning and weeping out of the weight of sin, and it also sings of how we, as Zion, will join Christ and Enoch with his triumphant band, triumphant in the air. Rising together is our communal destiny if we choose it. Again, it will be the most spectacular event in all of history. I want to be there. I want to do whatever I have to do to be there with my family and those I love. And I know as I love them and I help them, awaken to their potential in Christ and they love me that we can do it with him together. As we unite these multiple Zions, earth itself will become Zion and we are meant to prepare Zion below to blossom and join Enoch's and Melchizedek's and others Zion's above as patriarchs and matriarchs have done before us. This is Zion rising Let's join our hearts in Zion rising now. Zion, just to recap, is not merely a place. It is a state of being, a creative coexistence. Zion blossoms when we knit our hearts, gifts, talents, and minds together as one after being reawakened to our shared purpose to return to heaven above and as we follow our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thus Zion is wherever God's people extend their souls to the heavens above together. This is why Christ tells us that where one or two are found gathered together in his name, he will be in our midst. This gathering and yearning together, reaching for heaven above, this gathering and reaching itself leads us to love one another, forgive one another, and rise with Christ to Zion above. What are we waiting for, for this? I know some people wonder if the earth needs to become more destructive, more dark, more decaying before Christ will come again. I remember having a conversation with a relative about that. They were like, how much worse does it have to get? We're in a global pandemic. We're dealing with economic ruin. We're dealing with wars and pestilence. We're dealing with lightning storms and killer bees and earthquakes out of season and tornadoes out of season and all this insane stuff that happened in 2020 and 2021. But the reality is that we're not waiting for the earth to get more dark and darkened in, in, in its hellish hue that Satan is trying to bring about on the earth. What we're waiting for is us. Joseph Smith taught that we can receive everything he received as quickly as we're willing to bear it. And everything we need already exists spiritually around us. We know that from Moses 3.7 because God creates everything spiritually before he creates it physically. 
Zion has been calling in each of our hearts since Adam and Eve fell, inviting us to remember, to receive truth, light, and love from Christ, and to create Zion here below. So I hope you can again hear his voice, Christ's voice in this rather than mine. He is the author of all divine and elevating virtues, the creator, the lamb, the lion, the source of living waters, the prince of peace, the redeemer, my Lord and your Lord. He is the architect of Zion. And as we follow him, so are we. As we join hands with Christ, we will begin to radiate and rise and Zion in her glory will regain its celestial place in the heavens above. I leave that with you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of Zion. Amen. Brought to you by Cedar Fort Publishing and Media.